Hello, Uncle folks. Thanks for tuning in this evening. We've got something pretty exciting in store for you. Uh, I'm just going to give you a quick preview. Since unfortunately, Craig Matthews couldn't be with us this evening. Um, but what we've done is we've pre recorded 11, get ready, 11 different Craig Matthews patterns tied by the master himself uh, in store for you this evening. Uh, so again, this is a pre recorded session. Uh, meaning that Craig took time out of his day to, to tie these flies step by step, give you the why, the how, uh, and a lot of those fine details of some of his patterns. Um, we're really excited about Craig's session this evening. I hope you guys are too. So again, if you guys have questions, comments, uh, drop them into our feed. What we're going to be doing is uh, aggregating all of these comments, sending them over to Craig, and he'll be responding uh, offline through our blog uh, for you guys uh, with those specific questions. So again, if you're tuning in, we've got Craig Matthews tying 11 patterns this evening. Um, this is a pre-recorded session, uh, so we're going to get through a lot of stuff. Uh, it's going to be up the gut tying instruction on some amazing patterns. Um, a couple reminders here for everyone that supported the Flies for Andrew. There are still great auctions going on. Pat Dorsey put up a great one. Uh, there's a number of other things, so check out Flies for Andrews. For everyone that took part in the UMCO one, we are extremely grateful um, for your, your support of one of our tires and friends, Andrew Grillos. His road recovery is strong. I watched a video of him today running along, and he's looking really, really good. So, uh, again, the, the outpour um, is really felt, and he's super humbled by it all. So thank you again for that. Next up in our signature tire series is Mr. Charlie Craven with a two-part series that's not to be missed. Charlie's going to be doing a couple of his super timely nymphs, uh, and then he's moving into some of his 2021 patterns that are going to be out in January. Don't miss out on that. After that, we've got Team USA member and national champion Norman McTyma tying up four of his patterns uh, with a little special something coming with that. And then we're doing the kind of Andrew Grillo's holiday extravaganza uh, for Christmas. So definitely check it out. Um, we've got a lot of really fun things. If you've missed any of the sessions and want to see them, they are up on our YouTube channel and Facebook. Go check them out. This is really, really amazing tying material uh, from Umqua Signature Tires. So without further ado, Craig Matthews pre-recorded for all of you guys. We hope you had a th happy Thanksgiving and look forward to seeing you on here. Cheers. Hi, I'm Craig Matthews. Uh, God, I've been an Umqua fly designer for more years than I hate to admit it. It's certainly been over 30 years. We've had a lot of fun. Um, we've come up with some really great patterns over time, some uh, tried and true patterns. And I'm really proud of the fact that at one time I owned Blue Ribbon Flies and we had some great fly tires and some great fly designers there. And by fly designers, I mean flies that are designed to imitate certain stages of insects or bait fish, if you will, uh, foods that trout feed on, not just throwing a bunch of materials on a hook that look kind of cool and saying, there, that might catch a fish and it probably would catch a fish. But I like to, to respect fish and respect trout in particular and imitate what they're feeding on. And with that, uh, we've come up with several innovative fly patterns, I think, and we're gonna tie a bunch of those tonight. So thanks for, thanks for viewing and uh, we're gonna have at it. You know, the serendipity is, is quite arguably one of the most effective nymph patterns ever. Uh, fished on rivers like the Madison, Henry's Fork, Beaverhead, Big Hole, Big Horn. And it's probably the most easiest of the flies to tie. Um, Nick Nicholas really kind of perfected the pattern uh, for blue ribbon flies many years ago. And it imitates, uh, you know, the pattern mostly is sold with a bead head, tied with a bead. But tonight we're going to tie one that's a little easier and a little quicker, and it's without the bead. We use uh, Coffee Brown Danville 6070 Denier Flymaster thread, small UTC gold wire, and you have to tie this fly as slim as you can. So you tie the wire in, you wrap your thread to cover the wire, 
where you, at the tie-in point, bring it all the way forward just to the point beyond the hook eye. And now with open wraps, segment the body with your fine gold wire, your small gold wire, several wraps. Trout don't care if you have eight wraps or 12 wraps, but it's, this fly is gonna work. Now just wrap and break off that wire. You don't have to wreck your scissors by cutting it. And now we're gonna put a wing pad of deer hair, but we're gonna tie the wing in by the tips. So we're gonna trim the wing, so we're not sitting here spending a half an hour trying to fine tune that wing once we tie it off. Couple loose wraps and then tighten down on those wing butts. And now trim this part of the wing to form that emerging wing pad. Now when you see fish rising, you know, that smutting type rise right in the film, and you're about ready to go to your car and call it quits, and you throw your fly rod up and you say, I can't fool those fish, tie this in 18s and 20s, 16s, you'll fool those fish. A very effective fly pattern to have fishing these western rivers and every river, river in the west. That's the uh, standard serendipity, brown serendipity, sands bead. You know, midges emerge on every trout stream in the world every day of the year, every day of the season. You have to be prepared to fish midges. And everybody shies away from fishing midges initially until they finally get into it and go, my God, I've never had more fun fishing a dry fly. It's so visual. There's so many fish rising. I was on the river today. It's the end of November. Fish rising like crazy to, to midges. And one of the most important patterns, one of the most effective and easy to tie, you can tie 100 of these an hour, is our improved Zelon midge. And to tie it, once again, we're going to lay a little base of our working thread, which is 8-0 olive dun. You can use 8-0 light olive. You can use 8-0 rusty dun to imitate whatever color of midge you have in your area. Most of our midges are imitated by either olive or light dun. Now we're going to dub, I'm sorry, we're going to tie the shuck on and the shuck is dark dun or medium dun zelon. And now we're gonna tie the wing on. We're gonna go forward, just forward of halfway up the hook shank, and we're gonna figure eight a wing of Zelon onto the hook shank. And next I'm gonna trim it, and then I'm gonna show you a view from up on top. I hope you can see that. There's the wing of Zelon. And now simply with our, and this is very important, this dubbing, it's called Midge Black Zelon Dubbing. It's got a little bit of sparkle in it, a few guard hairs, dead realism in terms of the legs of a midge. But you want to do a fairly slight body. You don't want a big fat body because I've never met a fat midge yet. There's one fiber that's driving me nuts and it's gone. Okay, now take this back, tie it just forward of the shuck. Now carry this forward to a point just beyond, behind the uh, tying point of the wing. Now I'll go forward and fill that in and now figure eight around the wing. And if you want, you can actually force the wing back with your thorax thorax and leave it just as is. Notice how that is. You can see the guard hairs and they imitate, like this guy here, they imitate the legs of a midge and midges have extremely long legs. And now with finish. This fly will work as well as any other midge pattern and I guarantee it's easier to tie than any other midge pattern. The improved Zelon midge. The next fly is called a Scotty's midge, and where it got its name is a very close friend of ours, Scotty Heppel from Memphis, Tennessee. We often use him kind of as a guinea pig. Here, try this 
fly pattern Scott, and he came in one day and he said, God dang, I saw these big brown trout over on the Ruby River and they were taking skittering midges, emerging midges that were skittering, they were still caught in their pupil shuck. And in the wintertime and springtime, the pupil shucks on a lot of these flies will be this color here, Coachman, what we call Coachman Red Zealon, almost like a beer bottle color. With that, we use that and you can see that red color, the trailing shuck, and we see fish go out of their way to take a fly with a red shuck in the winter and early part of the season. Okay, so we're using light olive 80 uni thread that our thread over the wraps of Zelon, our shuck, is going to form the abdomen. A fairly short shuck. Now we're going to tie a thorax of our midge black Zelon dubbing. Once again, very important because you've got some sparkle and you've got some spike to this dubbing. There's some guard hairs trapped in that and limitate the legs of an emerging midge, which are very long. There's the abdomen, okay? Now you're not gonna believe this, but this wing that we tie on, tie it forward, almost a, a la Bob Quigley style, in the Quigley cripple style. And what this fly will do is it'll move on its own. It basically catches wind catches a slight breeze or the current or the breeze from the, that the current is creating and it skitters this fly. And it was designed to do that. And again, that word design. Okay, a short wing forward, one, two turns, just like we did on a sparkle gun, a couple more to lock it in. Now we trim the butts. Now notice we're gonna leave some of these butts exactly as is. That's the fly right there. Now we're gonna whip finish. Resisting all temptation to trim any of those fibers, leave those fibers. They imitate the wings of a struggling midge trying to get out of the shuck. Trim that one hair though right there. There it is, it's Scotty's midge. View from up on top. View from the body. This fly will skitter on its own, and I guarantee this fly will catch most rising fish you see selectively taking midges. Scotty's midge. Really, the most important mayfly emergence on the Madison River and several other western rivers, the Gallatin, uh, parts of the Yellowstone, is the EP horse, the pink lady hatch, late in the summer. And the spinner is extremely important in the evening and uh, quite often there'll be a spinner fall in the morning. And people miss this spinner, um, the spinner activity. They think, oh my God, trout are feeding on caddis. And you've got to have an EPR spinner and you have to know when to change to it. You'll see a different rise form, that classic head and tail sip to a spinner and people go, oh, yep, they're taking caddis. Uh-uh, they're taking EPR spinners. You'll catch an additional few fish every evening if you are on top of things. This fly is easy to tie. You'll note it incorporates foam so it floats like a cork. I use this fly for imitating um, spinners such as gray drakes, green drakes, small western green drakes, brown drakes, the foam hackle spinner. Simply a few tail fibers and bear in mind, EPRs occupy bumpy water. So we're going to put a few fibers. I'm not just going to splay out a couple of fibers to imitate the tails. We're going to put a few fibers to help float this fly pattern. You can get by with several fibers on an EPR spinner. It's an extremely important fly in the West. There are several streams that it's just paramount that you carry EPR spinners. And a lot of people, those in the know, some of the old guys, they call them pink ladies, and they're the guys that really do well with during an EPR spinner fall. Okay, tails. This is a TMC 100 hook. My favorite dry fly hook. Gonna 
carry that forward, very slender body up forward to a point where we're going to tie in a section of closed cell foam. And the foam is going to back the hackle fiber wings that are used for the spinner wings. It greatly adds again in flotation. You can see this fly a mile away. It requires no constant babysitting with desiccant to float it. This fly floats like a cork. Two things right here. You can either um, wrap the hackle forward right now, or you can put a slightly, a real slight dub body, slight dub thorax here if you want to. I'll, I'll put just a, just so that the hackle can bite into something rather than just basically a bare hook shank. That's Pink Lady Spinner Dubbing, super fine dubbing. And now we're going to take several turns of hackle, open turns, four, five, six turns, however many you want to put. And again, you're fishing sometimes very bumpy water with a spinner. So it doesn't hurt to put on an extra heavy wing, down wing of hackle fibers. Trim this. Some people right now will take this foam and pull it forward separating, which I will do if I'm fishing. Notice how that is, it separates those fibers into the wing. Just pull that down. couple of good turns. And I should mention some people will cut a V in the hackle wing prior to their pulling the, the wing for the foam forward. Just depends on how heavy you want that hackle wing. You can always trim a few fibers out of the way later. If you trim them out now while you're in the tying process, it's a saga because you can't add, add them once you're done. Now what we're going to do at this stage is we're gonna turn our fly upside down and cut a V in the hackle. That's our foam hackle spinner, pink lady style. Again, we tie them in green drakes, small Western green drakes, brown drakes, gray drakes, very effective fly floats like a cork, wonderful pattern. The iris caddis is probably the most effective emerging caddis pattern known to man. And I am reminded of that daily during caddis time by friends and customers who fish it. And John Jurasek really perfected this pattern over time. It's easy to tie. It floats like a cork. You can see it, particularly at dark when caddis Emergences are so prevalent. Once again, that shuck, that Zelon shuck, trailing Zelon shuck, so important to these flies. We're going to tie a hydropsyche um, iris caddis. When they emerge, their bodies are brilliant orange and they turn immediately to a dirty brown color within a second or two. But to highlight the color of this, we're going to tie the bright orange one tonight. And this really is an amber colored dubbing. And notice the Zelon in this dubbing. A lot of sparkle in the dubbing. Once again, a very fat, robust body of amber Zelon. Now to, to tie this fly, if you're fishing this fly and you're tying it for after dark, and you're tying, this is a size 15, 102 Y TMC hook one of our favorite hooks, as sharp as can be. Um, and sometimes I'll put a double wing on, most of the time just a single loop wing. Let's tie a double one. Right now we're gonna double the strand of Zelon. And here's a little secret. <laughs> kind of breathe on your fingers. Put your two fingers right to the edge of your mouth, <laughs> breathe on them. And next, just take that and splay that wing. Just the little bit of moisture left on your fingers is going to give that wing the perfect look. Harry Mayo, God rest his soul, taught us that kink years ago. With that 
wing now, we're gonna double that and we're going to put it right at the tie-in point of the shuck where the shuck and the body meet. Hold that down with your thumb and make several good wraps. And notice how that wing lays flat on the body and it actually loops the body and it floats like a cork. Now, don't be too quick to trim this. Standard, Z -line, standard iris caddis, we're gonna trim this now, put some dubbing and call it good. But if you're tying these for yourself and you wanna fish them late at night, well after dark, dub right now, resist cutting this. I'm gonna add this as a tremendous fly for imitating the October caddis steelhead wise in a size six. Rivers like the Bulkley and the Skeena, Kispiox and the Dean. Dub some forward and some behind. Now whip finish. Notice how quick we tied that fly. Gary LaFontaine, when he, he and I were working on the book, Fly Fishing the Madison, which we did together shortly before he passed away, admitted to me, he said, that's the most goddamn effective caddis emerger pattern there is. Now all strands, pick up on them and trim and leave this. This is what I call a waking post. And it's very valuable, it accepts more floating and you can actually wake it. And that's really important when fishing after dark because you'll see these emerging caddis skittering, trying to escape their shuck. And you can do the same thing in the moonlight and you will just kill the fish. And also for steelhead, you can put a little uh, head cement on it and wake it, very effective pattern, the iris caddis. Back in the early 1980s, um, John Jurasek and I came up with a pattern that a staple fly pattern all around the world is called the sparkle knife. And we came up with it while fishing the Henry's Fork of the Snake, where these big, huge, uh, selectively feeding rainbows were taking pale morning duns. We laid on the bank that day and we watched right at, right at the end of our nose, less than a rod length away. We watched these big rainbows sipping impaired duns. Those duns that were crippled, if you will, they couldn't escape the surface, the tension of the surface film, and they were trapped in their sparkling, shimmering shuck. And uh, we went back to the shop and we found a material that later actually morphed into Zelon, which has a sparkle to it, it's trilobal like Antron, but it's called Zelon, and Zelon floats like a cork. And it imitates perfectly um, that sparkling, shimmering shuck that these fish were trapped in. So with that, we tied some of sparkle duns, which are essentially a compare done with a trailing shuck, and they work like a dream. And since then, uh, we've used them all around the world, and so have a lot of millions of fly fishermen have. And to begin tying, it's a very simple pattern. And to begin tying it, what we're gonna do is use uni thread on a TMC 100 hook or a 100 SPBL. We lay a foundation of our working thread between two thirds and three quarters of the length of the hook shank up towards the eye. And now we're going to stack a wing of natural deer hair. And this is key, it has to be hollow deer hair. It has to be coarse and hollow. It can't be fine. It's not from the mask of a deer because the deer hair off a mask of a deer is not hollow. And by hollow, watch what happens. You'll see what hollow hair does. One loose wrap, another loose wrap, Pull straight down and see that deer here spring up. If it doesn't spring, it's not hollow. And the reason hollow here is so important, as you're gonna see right now, it compresses. It compresses and it doesn't add bulk to the fly. It floats like a cork. Notice how that compressed. And because it compressed, we're gonna get a properly proportioned fly when we're all done. Now here's the Zelon I was talking about earlier. Zelon is tri trilobal in nature like Antron. It sparkles like crazy. It imitates that trailing nympho shuck. And so many duns in big emergences like Betis, Little Blueing Olives, and Pale Morning Duns end up to be stillborn. Impaired, crippled duns, if you will, caught in that nympho shuck, whether it's a wing or a leg or part of the body, it's caught in the nipple shuck. So we're gonna tie that shuck on, and we trim the Zelon, and we trim it about one half of the hook shank in length, two and a half and three quarters. You don't want it too long, 
or it'll get caught underneath the, the hook shank when you cast. Now this is really key to, to, stand, to stand this wing up. And I like to do that in thirds. I'll tie the wing on, now I'm gonna separate it with a wrap of thread. I'm gonna bring the next third, another wrap of thread, and finally I'm gonna take that whole wing and with several wraps of my working thread, and this is again, 8-0's uni thread, I'm gonna stand that wing up and I'm gonna flare that wing. And you can see that through the viewfinder. And now we're going to take super fine dubbing. Just any old super fine dubbing, as long as it's pale yellow, it imitates the body of a pale morning dove. Less is best. So many fly tires try to put on way too much dubbing. And if you can see this, hardly any dubbing gets spun on the tying silk. Now I've been doing a lot of winter fishing, late season fishing, and my hands are really rough. And that's why sometimes there's burrs in your, in your skin and they catch on the on the thread and the dubbing. Okay, I'm gonna start one wrap slightly ahead of the tie-in point on the shuck and now I'm gonna fill that gap in. And next I'm gonna take and wrap forward and I'm gonna leave a space right here between the wing and the last of the abdomen. Now I'm gonna wrap ahead of the wing a couple wraps and I'm gonna fill that space in. In other words, I'm gonna figure eight around the wing, and that adds durability to your wing and your fly. Finally, I'm gonna whip finish. And always, always make use of a whip finisher because when you tie dry flies like this, then you don't have to use head cement. There's one fiber there that's driving me nuts. And there's, there's your finished fly. The wing fans 180, it's gonna float perfectly on that fanned wing. I should mention this, if you have fish, if you see fish that are taking a done that is totally tipped over, like a little sailboat that was tipped over in the wing, just crank that wing before your next cast, crank it over so your fly lays over on its side. Quite often big fish will do that. Normally this is gonna work, but again, we need all the help we can get catching those big uh, selective rainbows and brown trout to sparkle them. The next fly we're gonna tie is called our improved sparkle done. And what's improved about it is it's, it's, it floats a little bit better and it's a little bit easier to see. With that, we had a couple of young, young fly tires, twins, Doug and Dan Doffel and their, their cohorts working at the shop, Roland Nyman and probably Hoovler was involved too. And they were complaining, they said, God darn, we can't see that fly. And uh, hell, they're 30 years younger than I am, but they were having a hard time seeing it. So. We decided to incorporate a, a backing, if you will, a wing backing of Z-Line. And it not only makes it easier to see, but it floats it a whole lot better if you're fishing this fly in a little bit rougher water. Simply to tie this fly, we're gonna put our 8 tying thread again, and we're gonna build a foundation. And it's very important that you build a foundation of thread. If you don't build that foundation, your wing is gonna basically spin around that hook shank. And I hear guys complain of that, and I tell them, well, it's because you didn't lay a foundation of thread, your working thread. So make a few wraps to lay that foundation and your wing will seat right into the foundation and it will not spring around the hook, spin around the hook shank. Okay, and a lot of people say, how, much, how many fibers a deer hair? <laughs> well, if you're gonna sit here and count fibers, um, you got another guess coming. When you tie half a dozen to a dozen of these flies, you're gonna know automatically how many, you're gonna do it by feel. And every year we do, we make ourselves tie a fly or two blindfolded. And the reason being is you develop a feel for that material, those materials that you're tying with. It's very important to develop that feel. It adds in a properly uh, proportioned fly. It just looks a whole lot better and it works a lot better. Once again, here's our deer hair wing. One wrap, one wrap, two wraps, and now, you want to pull straight down and watch that wing spring. If it doesn't spring to life, you do not have the right deer hair. 
You want hollow, coarse deer hair. I cannot emphasize that enough. So many people will call and say, I need a piece of deer hair. And I'll say, what are you going to do with it? And they go, what's it to you? <laughs> and I say, well, I'll tell you what. If you're going to spin it, that's one thing. If you're going to tie the wings of a sparkle gun or an excatus, that's a whole different ball game. You need a whole different piece of deer hair. Next, I'm going to take the Z-Lon and I want to back the wing with that Z-Lon. So I tie that right against the back end of the wing. I'm going to take the shuck back all the way to the bend of the hook and I'm going to cut it off again about one half to two thirds of the length of the body. Now I'm going to stand the wing up. And a lot of guys say, oh heck, I'm going to dub forward and then when I get ahead of the wing, I'll put some dubbing and good enough. And we thought that was good enough one day. We tied eight dozen sparkle guns and we did just that and we went back the next day and the wing was like it is right now. You want to stand the wing up right now with wraps of your thread. So take that backing wing of Zelon and a third of your deer hair wing and pull it forward or pull it back and put a wrap of thread. Do that again with the next third and finally take the entire wing and wrap in front of it, creating a dam of your working thread. That's going to stand that wing up and it's going to keep it up. If you do it with Zelon, eight hours later, you're going to open up your fly box and you're going to be very disappointed because the wings will all be tilted forward. Now, dub a real thin body, properly proportioned dubbed body of super fine. This is bluing olive or olive gray super fine dubbing. The least amount you can dub on your silk, the better. And that will give you proper proportion. Okay, now we're going to go back I always put the first wrap slightly ahead of the shuck and then I fill in right at the tail end with the next wrap and now I start my body forward, leaving room behind the wing. I'm going to come forward a few wraps forward of the wing and now I'm going to figure right around that wing and that adds durability while keeping the proper proportion. Now if you have some few fibers of deer here, go ahead and trim them out of the way. Every now and then you'll get it, you'll get that. No big deal, just trim them out of the way, or they imitate legs of a mayfly. Now whip finish, cut your thread, stand that wing up, and take a look at how it looks. You got a backing of Zelon and a beautiful deer hair wing, 180, imitates a small western green drake that flies deadly. The X Caddis was uh, a fly that basically was invented by my wife Jackie. Um, the same summer as we came up with the sparkle gun. We're having a heck of a time catching fish on an elk hair caddis. An elk hair caddis does a great job Im imitating a uh, egg laying caddis, skittering on the surface of the water, good rough water fly, good hydropsyche egg laying fly, but it's not a good fly that imitates a crippled or impaired caddis like an ex-caddis. And Jackie just said, heck, if the sparkle done works for a mayfly, why don't you do the same thing for a caddis? Tie a shuck, a rough dub body and a deer hair wing, laid flat over the body for a caddis. So we did, and it worked like a dream. And it worked on the Henry's Fork and the Madison. We begin tying that fly by tying on a caddis dyed Zelon shuck. We're going to trim that shuck. And again, it just imitates a trailing shuck with a lot of life, a lot of sparkle. Now we're going to dub a rough body forward. And you want to keep this dub body very rough, very shaggy. And because you, you want to trap little pockets of air that traps sparkle like an emerging caddis. And caddis are bulbous, they're, they're robust, they're heavy bodied, not like a sparkle done, not like a mayfly done that's delicate like a mayfly. A caddis has got a little bit of beef to it. So you want a fat body and a shaggy body. 
You take your dub body forward to a point just behind the eye of the hook. And now you're going to tie a down wing of deer hair. I always look for a piece of deer hair that is clean, again, hollow and coarse, so it flares and it floats well. And you don't have to babysit it. You don't have to sit there and comb all the under fur out, which takes a lot of time. This piece of deer hair is really clean. And what I'll do is I'll trim it before I tie it on. That saves me a lot of jacking around trying to get the fibers once I get them, trim them once I get them tied in. Okay, so I'm gonna tie that and I'm gonna, with my working thread, I'm gonna wrap through those wing butts. And what that does is it seats that deer hair and it almost acts like a spun deer hair head, which really adds greatly in the flotation of this fly. And notice now we don't have to sit here and spend a half an hour trimming that head. We got a, a nicely trimmed head already because we pre-trimmed the deer hair. We've got a, a flared body that cups this caddis, the body of the fly, so it looks like a crippled caddis, and we've got the trailing shuck, X caddis. Works like a dream every time. You know, as with the uh, sparkle gun, and then we <laughs> morphed into the improved sparkle gun, both of which work like a dream. Matter of fact, I fish the sparkle gun 90% of the time and the improved 10%. It's the same thing here with the improved X caddis or the X2 caddis. And that fly was, was designed by a couple of young men that worked for us, Doug and Dan Dolfo, many years ago. And uh, they wanted a fly that floated a little bit lower in the water, had a little bit more sparkle, more of a spring creek, if you will, caddis. So we're going to tie their fly. And again, this is called the Improved X Caddis. Once again, you have to have a trailing shuck because that's what fish recognize. They recognize that this is a caddis trapped in its shuck and it's not going to be able to readily fly off the surface of the water. And they take it with such confidence. So there's your trailing shuck of Zelon that's dyed um, what we call caddis. It's just a universal color. Next, we're gonna put a strand of crystal flash. And it just adds a little sparkle segmentation, if you will, to the body. So now we have a strand of crystal flash and that'll become our ribbing. And now we're gonna dub a body of olive. This is a Mother's Day caddis. Brachycentris, early season caddis that hatches around the time of the holiday named Mother's Day, which is of course during May, June, and it comes off in huge numbers in and around Yellowstone country. As a matter of fact, sometimes the hatch is so heavy you can barely fish it. There's just way too many insects. I've seen mats of insects four and six inches deep. Okay, now we're going to take that rough dub body and see that sparkle in there that's so important and resist all temptation to trim you want that fly to be shaggy like that imitates an emerging caddis very well now we're going to take our crystal flash and rib through that body creates a little bit of segmentation and adds a little bit of sparkle now we're going to take a strand of Zelon, white Zelon, neutral color Zelon. And we're gonna tie that Zelon on for an underwing. Tie it on, pull a little bit back, trim it off right where the tie in point of the shuck was, and now separate it. And you can do that with your thread. You can figure it around the, the wing but you want to separate it. You want little outrigger wings of Zelon, natural colored Zelon. That too adds a little bit of sparkle to your fly. Now we're going to tie a wing of natural deer hair. I prefer dark deer hair for this. Some guys want real light for visibility. I find I can see darker deer hair better in bumpy water. 
Okay, you can see that Xelon peeking through. That's very important, that sparkle to be peeking through your wing. And now we're gonna dub a rough dubbed head with natural hairs mask or Hydropsyche tan Xelon dubbing. You want a real robust head One fiber there that's going to have to go, but other than that, and then caddis once again, I shouldn't even say, shouldn't trim it, but resist all every temptation to trim. You want this fly to be very, but this fly, this little fiber drives me nuts because it's going to get caught in your, in your knot, your tippet knot to the fly. There it is, the X2 caddis, beautiful fly, easy to tie, and it floats like a cork. You know, for many, many years, we've spent as much as six weeks in Belize and the Bahamas, the Yucatan, fishing bonefish and permit. I love big single bonefish. And I'll never forget the first time we showed up at Turner Flats Lodge and Pops, our old guide walked up to me and I'm sitting there with crazy Charlies and he looked at them and said, you crazy Americans show up with flies that don't imitate what these bonefish feed on. That really intrigued me. So we spent a week and then the next year, two weeks and following years up to six weeks learning what big bonefish selectively feed on. They love urchins, they love small crabs. We designed a fly called the Pops. We named it after Pops, our guide, Winston Cabral, the bonefish bitters. And the bitters of course was a drink that they used and we won't get into the history of that drink. Um, it's a strong alcoholic drink. Anyway, um, to tie it, you use a mo blank, um, any epoxy or hot glue blank like this will work with or without a bead. I prefer a bead. Next, we're going to take silly legs and we're going to take three or four of them. I like prefer four because invariably one will get busted off by a bonefish when they get in those powerful crushers. And I should add, I've caught as many uh, permit on this fly mostly an olive for permit, but bonefish like amber and they like olive. So you're gonna figure eight that. Sometimes the best retrieve too, I should mention, is no retrieve. I've had a lot of fish take this. I've recently had a permit come and take the fly. I set the hook, I had him on for a few minutes. Hook came out, guide screaming and yelling. We stood there for a minute, fish came right back and took the fly again. It was a little six pound permit. Gonna take a little Z-line right here, tie that on between the legs, just adds a little flash, and it also acts as a weed guard. And now we're gonna put on a permanent weed guard, a little bit better weed guard, and that's deer hair, some deer hair fibers. A very short overwing of deer hair, like such, and that's it. And this fly will take the biggest tailing bonefish. And again, sometimes the best retrieve is no retrieve. I've had incredible luck presenting this fly, giving it one little twitch and just letting it settle in the coral or the mud, the sand. There's a Pops bonefish bitters, tremendously effective bonefish fly and permit fly. Spending so much time permit and bone fishing and, and even tarpon fishing, um, with crabs and how effective small crab patterns are. And you know, we had a heck of a time tying bower crabs and figuring out how to tie, you know, the mick crab and all those fancy crabs that work like a dream, but they take so much time to tie. So with that, we said, you know what, we're gonna design a fly that works as well, that's easier to tie. And with that, we tied the turn of foam crab. It's very easy to tie, simply you're gonna put some lead eyes or some non-toxic lead eyes on, just figure eight those on. Next, put some hard as hull or whatever. Now I'm gonna spin that hook shank. And we're gonna tie the rest of the fly facing up. Now I'm gonna tie, and this is a platform for our legs. I'm gonna tie four rubber legs out each side 
of the fly. Just simply figure eight some rubber legs. And you can use, you know, we've used Bronil for legs. We've used a wide variety of materials. And just when you think, oh, I got the magic fly and the, the right material, somebody comes along and goes, hey, that didn't work for me. I use such and such. Experiment. But if you're buying flies, this one here is a, is a solid bet you're going to catch fish on it. Foam crab. Now, this material, furry foam, is found in all the cheap motels as blankets. And you can buy it for about a buck and a half, two bucks for a great big sheet of it. We're going to tie this on for the body of the crab. And tie it well back beyond the point of the hook. And I'll tell you why. Bonefish in particular take, big bonefish take with such precision. I was tying them short for a while and I was getting short hits. So we had to tie them back behind the hook point. See how that's going to be when we fold it forward? Okay, now bring the foam forward. and tie that off. I like to leave legs fairly long. These are a little bit too long. So I'll trim them down a little bit, like such. Finally, I'm gonna put a, a good weed guard on, or a good coral guard, simply some deer hair. Same basic deer hair we use for sparkle duns and X caddis, of course, it's going to flare well. Notice how that protects the hook point. It's going to be able to go right through the coral. Pick up on that tag end. Tie it off. Trim the head. And now, you know, if you really want to get fancy, and I do, I like to do this, I just take a marker, a Sharpie, a marking pen, put some modeling on the legs. We'll do it to half the legs here, just to illustrate. Put a little red or a bright pink tip on each leg, like such. And there you go. The turn of foam crab. Liberally coat the bottom with hard as hoe head cement. It'll catch a couple of great big uh, permit and it'll catch several big bonefish. Turn a foam crab. Thank you so much for uh, being a part of our fly time night. Really appreciate it. Uh, if you ever have any questions, post them up and I'll, I'll answer them as quick as I can. Um, this has been so much fun for me. And I know all the fly tires that we've worked with over the years and all the fly designers, I, I, I hope you're watching tonight because um, you've all had a big effect on what we have done as fly designers, whether you work for us one summer or, or 40 summers. It's all been a great time. I hope it goes for another 40. Um, your influence is greatly appreciated. Thanks for Umqua, to Umqua for providing this forum. Um, I hope we can do it again. And all the signature fly tires have been such a, a great influence on, I know, conservation and on the, the sport of fly fishing and fly time. I'm going to put a plug in for our 1% for the planet. Um, we broke recently uh, $290 million for conservation. And myself and Yvonne Chouinard from Patagonia founded that organization a few years ago. Businesses that make a living because of a healthy resource need to give back little bit more and that's how we came up with the idea. So thank you so much. Thank you for your friendship and your influence and really appreciate it. And please uh, consider joining conservation groups today like Trout Unlimited, International Federation of Fly Fishers, groups that really put things together and, and conserve and protect and preserve um, what we all know and love as fly fishermen. Thanks so much and I'll see you on the water.